Well, hello, everybody. Pastor Steve here. We've come to the end of the week. And while you're opening your Bible to Hebrews chapter 10, I want to wish my beautiful bride, Monisa, uh, a happy birthday. Her birthday is this Sunday, the 21st. And since I'm not doing a devotion on the 21st, I want to take this opportunity to tell her happy birthday. And I love her and I'm so proud of her. All right. Hebrews chapter 10. Um, this, this chapter really could be divided or broken into to three portions or three sections. They build on one another and they, they flow together. But three three distinct focuses, if you will. Uh, the first one, verses one and following, uh, he, he continues what we were talking about Friday, how the Old Testament mosaic law and tabernacle and temple and sacrifices and priesthood, how that whole system was a a shadow of the real thing of the new covenant in Jesus, okay? Um, and and that in this new covenant, as we talked about a few days ago, uh, he quotes Jeremiah again, God has written his laws on our hearts, so we don't have the Mosaic law. We, we are changed on the inside, and that's why Jesus said uh, the great commandments is what? Love God and love people. If you do that, you fulfill everything. And, and, and so that's the new covenant. And, he, and he, he talks about Jesus, the one offering, one time for all people, saving forever those who believe. That's the opening section. Um, starting in verse 19 of chapter 10, he encourages these believers. Now, re- remember, he's writing this letter to believers, disciples, Christians who were Jews. So these are Jews who accepted Jesus as their Messiah or Savior. And he's and starting in verse 19, he encourages them to, and, and us as well, to boldly go to the throne of God, to, to boldly seek the presence of God, to not walk away. And, and he challenges us in these verses to encourage one another in our faith uh, and in love for the Lord and, 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 and for one another. And then starting in verses in verse 26 through the end of the chapter, he sounds a warning, a warning, and he, he ends that warning with a very clear challenge, if you will. So I want us to read it and then talk about it because this is a passage that can be confusing and that some groups like, say, the Holiness and Nazarenes and others, these are verses they use to say you can lose your salvation the way we discussed back uh, in the first part of chapter 6. And so let's read this together and talk about it. Verse 26, he said, For if we go on sinning willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. We've we've already seen that, and we'll see it in verse 18 of this chapter and other places. Jesus only died once. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of the fire which will come, which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses going back to the Old Testament law. Verse 29, how much severer, worse punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace. The Holy Spirit is the one who calls us to Jesus. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, he's quoting Old Testament passages. The Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And those are verses that some, along with Hebrews 6, some people use to say, well, you can lose your salvation. I want to point out, though, that if this is talking about losing your salvation, just like in chapter 6, it also makes it clear, if, if that's how you interpret this, that you can't be saved again. Because he said, if you go on sinning willfully, there is no longer a sacrifice for your sin. You used it once, and Jesus is not going to die a second, third, fourth time. So all the groups, whether it's, whether it's God, you know, uh, holiness groups or Nazarene groups and others, you get saved and you can lose your salvation. You get saved again, you lose your salvation, you get saved again. Well, no, if, if, Hebrews 9, if Hebrews 10 and Hebrews 6 are talking about losing your salvation, I don't think that's what they're talking about, but, but if, if you interpret it that way, both of these passages also make it crystal clear there is no getting saved a second time. So I remember uh, there was a professor back in the 
uh, the 70s and, uh, and 80s at Southern Seminary in Louisville, where I graduated in, in 80, when did I graduate? 83, December 83, who believed in apostasy. But I respect the fact that he took these passages seriously and said the only way you can lose your salvation is you have to reject God, knowingly reject him after being saved, and you can never be saved again. But most groups who think you can lose your salvation, oh, you get saved, lost, saved, lost. No, 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 that's a distortion of Scripture. There's just, uh, that's, that's, it's crystal clear that, that that's wrong. You, there's no way to interpret these passages that way. Anyway, I digress a little bit. Continuing the passage uh, in verse 32, he's encouraging them. He says, but remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings when you first became followers of Christ. You, you, you endured great suffering, verse 33, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. Okay, you, you, you were persecuted. Verse 34, you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property. You love people who were in prison, and uh, if they persecuted you by taking some of your possessions, you, you didn't abandon the faith, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance so that, you, that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a little, very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, referring to the second coming. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are none of those who shrink back to destruction or ruin, but of those who have faith to the persevering of the soul. So what are these verses talking about? Does it mean you can lose your salvation? Well, if you interpret this to mean you can lose your salvation, there remains no more sacrifice. So there's not a sacrifice by which you can be saved a second time. Or in Hebrews 6, if you fall away, if you take that to mean losing your salvation, you cannot be renewed again to repentance. So one approach is that some, some will say, if you consciously knowingly renounce Jesus. In other words, you have been saved, but you reach a point where you no longer believe and you consciously, intentionally, knowingly repulse, reject, deny Jesus, trample on his blood, so to speak, figuratively, then you will be lost, but you can never be saved again. That's what Dale Moody, the professor at Southern Seminary, believed. The other approach and the one that I take is, is he's not talking about losing your salvation, but, but these Christians of Jewish background were being tempted and tested and pushed to go back into Judaism and thinking that legalism, that the law was part of salvation. And if you do that, you demean the blood of Jesus. See, anyone who says salvation is by faith and baptism demeans the blood of Jesus. Anyone who says salvation is by faith and good works demeans the blood of Jesus. Anyone who says salvation is by faith and church membership demeans the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus alone makes atonement for our sin and makes salvation available. Baptism doesn't. Church membership doesn't. Good deeds don't. Do's and don'ts and legalism don't. Obeying the law don't. But if you go back and you say, well, my works play a part. No, no, you live righteously because you are saved, not to be saved. And so he says, if you willfully start going the other direction, after you've received the knowledge of the truth, um, there's no more sacrifice. Like in Hebrews 6, he said, it's impossible to re renew them to repentance. In other words, they don't need to be re to repent and get saved again. Here, it's not that you need another sacrifice. Jesus' sacrifice is still good for you, even though you're treating his sacrifice horribly when you backslide, horribly when you choose to say, well, I think works and baptism and the, or for them, the Mosaic law is also part of it. Uh, it's a, 
is, is a bad thing. And, and he says, they're, they're, what happens is you lose your confidence. That's, that's the reason later in this chapter, he said, don't throw away your confidence. Don't throw away your assurance of faith. Because when you, when you move away from, from, from Jesus being and his blood being the only way of salvation, when you backslide as a Christian, you're filled with doubt. And you start at times feeling like someone who's far from God and lost. And I've often said, that the most miserable person on earth is a Christian not walking in fellowship with Jesus. A disobedient, backslidden Christian. You're miserable. And um, he said, so that, that, that's why he says in verse 27, there's this terrifying expectation of judgment. God's going to do something. And you feel that. Of, of a fire of judgment that will consume the adversaries um, in verse 29, you deserve it. It doesn't say you'll receive that kind of judgment, but you deserve it. And the key for me is verse 30, where he quotes the Old Testament saying, vengeance is mine, I will repay, and the Lord will judge his people. This is talking about God judging his people, not God judging the lost. The Lord will judge his people. Does God discipline and punish his people? You better believe it. And when you... You start making salvation about the blood of Jesus and your own good works. You're you're going to be find yourself under the hand of God's judgment. When you start backsliding and willfully sinning, you're going to find yourself under the judgment of God. God judges His people. He disciplines His people. Terrifying to fall into the hands of it's it's, it's terrifying. It's frightening to be under the judgment of God. Um, you know there are times when children. <laughs> are afraid for their parents to find out something. No. The thing is, see, for, for us, God knows, and that can be a frightening thing. It says, but I want to encourage you to, to, to remember how you got started in this walk with God and how faithful you were and you were willing to suffer. So don't quit. Don't go back to the old way. Stay. Keep being faithful the way you were in those early days. Don't turn back. So verse 35, don't throw away. He doesn't say don't throw away your salvation. In verse 35, he says don't throw away your confidence, which is great reward. When you know you're walking with Jesus and you know you're living for Jesus and you know you're saved, not perfect, but you know you're right with God and you're living for him and loving him, growing in him and serving him, that confidence, that boldness has a reward in and of itself. But it's miserable to have very little faith. It's miserable to have weak faith because you're not walking in fellowship with God. And so he says, we need to endure. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Because when you quit, you suffer. He says in verse 39, we're none of those who shrink back to destruction. That doesn't mean hell. That means ruin. When you, when you turn your back on God, you make a mess of your life. Bottom line, turn your back on Jesus, backslide, walk away. Don't, don't, don't live in faith. Don't live in obedience anymore. Just you'll mess up as a Christian. You're miserable and you make a mess of life. But we're not going to do it. We're going to persevere. The, the, we're, we're going to, to keep our faith strong and grow to the preserving of the soul. And part of the problem is in English, we, we miss it's the soul is, is the word for not just your soul, but your life. We preserve our life. We preserve the vitality of life in our walk with God to be healthy and beautiful. So that's what he's talking about. And, and, and I'll close with this devotional thought. Look at verse 22, let us draw near. Verse 23, let us hold fast. Verse 24, let us consider. Verse 35, don't throw away. You see, the, the quality of your walk with God is up to you. You are responsible. You, me, individually, we are responsible for the quality of our spiritual health and our walk with Jesus Christ. So let us draw near to him, not drift away. That's the lesson. I'll see you tomorrow as we look at a beautiful chapter, chapter 11, the Faith Hall of Fame. God bless you, everybody.